Okay, uh, we're going to move on to the next talk. Uh, we're going to move into the world of acoustics and of the water at the same time. So I'm going to let Paul explain everything about how we achieve things and what he's actually trying to achieve. Okay, can everyone hear me? Cool. So this is a bit of a random wander across quite a few different bits of technology. So hopefully there'll be something in there that interests you. Um, I'm basically going to go through background and introductions and sort of fields I'm working in, problems I'm trying to address are, how I'm solving them using embedded Linux, um, how I'm using particularly Open Embedded and the Octo project within these solutions, and then how I've got involved in these projects and took over a project called Oak Package, which is a package manager, so that's going to be sort of the second half of the talk, and then try and conclude it all together and go towards some future work. So you can probably tell I talk quite fast, so if I start getting ahead of anyone or you've got any questions, feel free to put in and slow me down. So me, I'm a PhD student of the University in the UK at the minute. Um, working on water acoustics. My background is hardware and software engineer, as well as um, sound and audio and signal processing work. So, the field I work in, in essentially day job really research, is underwater acoustics, and particularly looking at um, marine animals and how they use sound. Very cross discipline area biologists, acousticians, engineers, all sorts of different groups of people working together, and that makes it quite an interesting field. Um, I mean, why do we why do we care about this? Um, underwater acoustics itself, well. There's a lot of things that don't travel very well in water. So in air, we're used to using RF to get information around. Um, and humans, we use smell. Uh, a lot of animals um, use smell to find things. Underwater, those sorts of signals don't really travel very far. The one that travels well is sound. So what you end up with is these marine animals that have evolved to use sound as their primary mode of sensing their environment. So all their communication, um, particularly marine mammals, their navigation, their looking around for food um, and moving around is all based on their ability to use sound. And the other difference between the sort of sound in air and the water stuff that we're interested in, humans have a hearing bandwidth of sort of 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz nominally. Um, marine mammals as a very, very rough first order, it's a much wider bandwidth. So maybe it's almost two orders of magnitude wider bandwidth. And that will come in a little bit later on when I start talking about the data processing to do with this. Um, and yeah, I should probably point out I'm you know PhD student scientist here, but some of this stuff I would probably qualify some of this a little bit better if it was a real science presentation. So take it with a little bit of a pinch of salt. Um, and you know why do we why do we care about marine animals anyway? Um, they're pretty important. Um, the, you know, the commercial fishing you start causing problems with fish, and fishermen get grumpy. Um, you know they're pretty important to the health of ocean ecosystems, which is important to us. When a lot of the oxygen we breathe is produced by algae and plankton in the ocean, and they're also quite important to a lot of communities for tourism. Um, it brings a lot of money into local economies. There's a lot of people who care for different reasons about marine animals, as well as just plain environmental concern. Now, a bit where this starts to run into conflicts is you've got a lot of human activities going on in the ocean. There's a bunch of different things we do. One of the big things at the moment is um, offshore wind farms. They, uh, they pile drive um, foundations into the ocean. And we also do seismic surveys looking for oil and gas that's making really loud bangs underwater so loud that it penetrates the ground, bounces off a uh, pocket of oil and comes back and you can tell there's oil there. We use sonar, uh, military and civilian uses, drive boats around everywhere, shipping goods and boat racing and all sorts of different things like this. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. Um, this is a photograph of a marine piling operation and the, they're driving a massive foundation cylinder into the ocean floor to put a wind turbine on top. 
and some of these things can be up to 6.5 meters diameter tube and they hit it with a hammer to drive it 20 meters into the ocean so there's a lot of energy going on Another one is um, dredging um, soil and debris up from the um, bottom of the ocean floor to use for construction and other projects. The important observation here is it's all pretty noisy. And it's pretty noisy in an environment where marine mammals and other animals are trying to use sound. And this is really an effect that's only been seen over the last 200 years and it's increased in the last few decades, so we've not really had a chance to evolve and counter that. So that really leads to the problem that I'm trying to solve, um, which is, you know, signal detection. If you've got higher levels of noise and these animals are trying to find sound signals that are the same level as they used to be, you get a lower signal noise ratio. And this makes it more difficult. Same principle for sonar systems, same principle for dolphins. Um, it interferes with their communication and it interferes with their navigation, hunting, and foraging. So it's a bit like, because this is the primary sensory way of seeing the environment, it's like blinding. Um, this has become a bit of a concern in recent years. The European Union's come in and said they want people to have this thing called good environmental status and they define noise as a pollutant, essentially. So that's the, that's the background of why, I'm, why this area is interesting. What I'm trying to solve is noise monitoring. So to ensure that these guidelines and this new EU stuff that's coming in is actually followed, to protect sensitive areas um, and to track trends over time, we need to be able to monitor the levels of noise and monitor in a way that's relevant to how it affects these marine mammals. So, current methodologies that get used for this monitoring is to go out and put a pretty dumb recorder in the ocean. It's got a hydrophone, which is the water equivalent of a microphone on the front of it. It's got some analog electronics to preamplify the signal and condition it. It's got an analog to digital converter to convert that to a series of sample values we can understand. And it stores that straight away in some proprietary format or usually just a WAV file on some basic storage, which is often banks and SD cards, that sort of thing. And these dumb recorders are deployed to the field, left there for the length of time you want to record. And at some later date, people go pick it up, bring it back to shore, pull the data off it, and do all their analysis on computer systems on shore. So there are several problems with these current methodologies. There's massive delays in access to data. If you, if you want to monitor an environment for six months, you might not get the data until the end of that six month period. And if you you can basically say six months ago you were too loud when doing these activities. It'd be much nicer to be able to say up front, you're too loud now, you can do something about it now rather than telling people six months later. There's a lot of cost in retrieving the data itself because you've got to go and fetch the um, fetch the device or you've got to run some sort of fiber optic cable, which if you're working a thousand kilometers offshore. Running a fiber optic cable out gets pretty expensive. And tends to be large amounts of storage needed for some of this. And this is something I'm just going to go on a little bit, do some quick, really, really quick calculations. To monitor that sort of wide bandwidth that these marine animals use, you need sort of 200 kilohertz bandwidth. Um, anyone doing, it's not 400 hertz, it should be 400 kilohertz. Anyone doing any form of signal processing on their micro steering says you've got a sample at twice the rate you care about. So you're at 400 kilohertz minimum sampling rate and 24 bits per sample in order to catch the sort of very wide dynamic range of sounds that's seen underwater. That comes out about 9.6 megabit per second continuous data rate into this device. If you want to record that, that's about 100 gigabytes per channel per day. And people are starting to ask questions like, what's the trend over the last five years? It's pretty difficult to do based on raw data. Um, so the, the current solutions that are employed to this are people reduce the sampling rate and don't capture all the frequencies of interest. And that means you can miss a lot of stuff that's relevant to these marine animals. People do duty 
cycling, decide to record for sort of five minutes every hour, ten minutes every hour, something like this, and um, so that we can do statistics but don't necessarily capture every event of importance, we can end up missing a lot, kind of discarding some pretty important information. So the idea I came up with is let's process the data as it's captured. Let's make the recording equipment a little bit smarter, put some embedded systems in there so that we process this data in the device that's deployed to the ocean. And then we can store or transmit analysis results rather than trying to store this huge amount of raw data. And also, once we've got these analysis results, we can feed these into, and you know, the biologists have said, here's a model for assessing the impact of this noise on marine animals. We can feed these analysis results into this and come up with a sort of real-time impact assessment. So it's a pretty good tool for solving some of these problems. Um, yeah, the benefits of this, you get real-time feedback. You can tell people there and then that they're too loud while they can still do something about it. Um, so, for example, driving a pile into the ocean floor, they can use less energy per strike. That makes it make less noise. Um, and, you know, the bandwidth after you've done this analysis is not 9.6 megabit per second anymore. It's a much more reasonable rate. Hopefully low enough that we can, you know, transmit it over satellite links from a buoy on the surface of the water, or use sort of uh, mid-distance range radio frequency links to transmit this data out to nearby ships. Um, and actually implementing this as a physical system has some pretty interesting system requirements. Um, you deploy a device to a pretty harsh environment, so it's surrounded by a pressure housing, sort of steel pressure housing, and the other thing, we can't use spinning disk hard disks, so it makes the cost of storage quite a lot more. Um, these things get thrown off the side of a boat on some piece of rope and lowered to the ocean floor and then hauled back up when they're finished with. If you start trying to write data to a spinning disk while you're doing that, if it clangs against the side of the boat, you're going to break your disk. Um, and also, like I said, the, these things being deployed to the ocean, you know, the, the hardware cost doesn't really matter so much when if you want to go and service this thing, you've got to hire a boat and all the crew and all the fuel to go out to this device that might be 100 kilometers offshore for a day or two to service it. So, it's not something you can go out and press the reset button on very easily. So essentially, it's got to have a lot of autonomy, a lot of stability, and also we care about power efficiency because um, this seems to be running its own local battery packs. Um, you know, you can, you can put a dustbin of batteries next to it, but that's even more weight to pull up and down for someone to have to deal with. So now getting away from the description of the problem into how I've actually implemented some of this. So it's pretty straightforward high level system design. Um, as I say, you've got the same sort of things I said you had on done recording. You've got hydrophone, pre-amplification, and analog front end stuff. Convert that signal to digital. And instead of just storing straight away, we now have some processing on a system that's got some drivers around it. Say in this case we've got customised preamplifiers that are really designed for the underwater work, and I picked up a pretty high rate um, analog digital converter that samples about 625 <coughs> samples per second. It's even higher rate than we actually need. Um, the actual signal processing I'm doing is actually pretty simple. There's nothing really complicated in what I'm doing. Um, if you've done any signal processing at all, all I'm looking at is some basic signal statistics, averages, standard deviations, things like that, what the peak level was at any time, and some third octave levels, which is just a way of grouping frequencies into bins that are relevant to the way the ear processes it. And also I'm picking out like loud impulses, bangs, and doing some different analysis on those. But it's really not very complicated signal processing. It shouldn't really require rooms full of server equipment to do this processing. It can be done on a small embedded device. 
um, data storage, um, just using simple things like SD cards, and for things I basically said for anything like RF transmission or links over like 3G mobile networks if you're close enough to shore. I've just said spit it out on the Ethernet and let some breach handle that. So I basically went through a bunch of choices for what hardware I could use for this. Um, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of low power dedicated DSP devices. I'm familiar with text instrument stuff, but there's, there's loads and loads of others that are sort of dedicated instruction set for running signal processing and stuff. Don't for a general purpose operating system. And I think the sort of analysis and level of control modeling I wanted to do didn't really suit these things very well. Um, I did look at Raspberry Pi and rejected it as it didn't really have enough processing power for what I'm doing. So on Friday, there was a uh, announcement that I saw via Reddit, which was somebody's actually took the GPU on the Raspberry Pi and implemented all the Fourier transform stuff on the GPU. So the fact that it doesn't have a dedicated DSP anymore might be able to get around. So where I started from scratch now, that might be a valid platform. What I settled on was the, the bigger one. Um, the, the XM was the one that was around when I started this in about 2011. Um, I picked that because it's got, um, it's got these dedicated signal processors that are very good for the mathematical ins and outs, next to an ARM processor that's very good for the control and all the flow of it. So, a couple of quick photos of this. This was the first generation of hardware from back end of 2011. It's the, the Vega board next to custom analog um, front end. And you can't really see so much, but this is on a little rail system with um, the back sort of end here is full of batteries. And the front, you can see a plate. This fits into uh, steel pressure housing, a sort of quarter inch, half inch thick steel cylinder that hopefully can withstand the water pressures involved. Because seawater and electronics doesn't really mix through. Um, the the big one, board in this case is just using the onboard sound card next to the analog stuff. So this is at a much lower sampling rate. And this was just to get a basic, basic system out the door. And I think this could be used in about 100 meters water depth off the coast of Denmark, I think. So this was the first generation, which was just a dumb recorder. Um, the, the second generation of this, um, this is just looking at so the slice and bottom is a big board. Um, this is just looking at sort of the central block that I put together that fits into the pressure housing. Slice in the middle is a custom PCB um, that I designed that does all the routes in. The top is a valuation module for an analog digital converter. And the top and bottom are off the shelf components. The middle one's custom designed, but I should probably get around to putting the schematics on GitHub at some point. Um, yeah, the intention is that's an open source PCB as well. Um, so, you know, what do we run on this? There's quite a lot of choices for stuff to run on the system. Uh, I wanted to run something that was a real operating system, so all the, like, writing to an SD card was just write to a file. Um, and you can put drivers in so that the software will just write to a file and that can go out over the network or whatever we want to do with it. Keeps it simple from software development point of view. Uh, there's lots of choices. Um, Android gets quite a lot of use, but you know, if you're developing something that looks like a tablet or a mobile phone, Android's a really good solution. If you're doing something like this that doesn't look anything like those, that doesn't have really the sort of same user interaction, you want something a little more specialised. Some people historically have used sort of stripped down desktop distributions so you can get Debian, Arch and a bunch of other things built for ARM. And some people will just try and strip that down to a minimal core that runs. Doesn't really work so well, especially for these sort of real-time systems. And there are other choices, QNX and other expensive proprietary embedded software, there's FreeBSD, there's a bunch of others, but I went with 
sort of specialised and embedded Linux distros that I kind of understood. And so it's this sort of total control where you can say precisely what software runs on the platform is pretty important when this thing's going to process about 10 megabit of data continuously. Um, and you know, to produce these couple of different options to actually produce this specialised embedded Linux system. The two seem to be quite popular, build root and embedded. Um, I think they're both pretty good systems. Um, build root works very well for the way you want to just create an image and put it on a device. Once that's gone out the door, you're kind of done with it. Um, open embedded, something I've seen seems to have a much more kind of full life cycle view of these things. Um, and it's got some benefits I'll talk about in a minute. Also, we're picking up the big board, the default system image is Angstrom, which is built using open embedded, so I kind of got used to it that way. And a lot of the times, the stuff you're used to using is the quickest way of solving the problem. When I actually started to look into this, open embedded had some really, really good benefits and features that were useful here. Um, I think the first one that really helps is license compliance because you're, what it does is it pulls down source archives, builds them into packages and then installs them on the device. And in that, it says what license everything is. And if it's a GPL license component, you can keep that source archive that downloaded yourself. And when you upload your binary package, you can upload the source package that was used to build it right next to it. So you can actually comply with the GPL pretty easily using this system. Um, it produces it produces a package feed. So the same thing as you'd get on any sort of desktop distribution. You can update from a package feed that the distribution has created, and you can upgrade your system to the latest versions of things. Open Embedded produces this sort of package feed. And this is a great thing for a device that you might want to, you know, you might want to solve some of the problems with it, you might find some bugs, you might want to improve some of the algorithms, add some new features to an existing device that's actually deployed in the field. Um, and if it has got some sort of wireless link to the rest of the world, you can update the actual software on it. I think also as I've got involved, I find it's got an excellent community and ecosystem of people around it, whether that's the the sort of open source community and also the commercial companies working in this space that you can get paid support from for actual you know, shipping products to customers. So looking, looking a bit at the software engineering side of this, it's sort of split down into a bunch of different components. Um, I'm probably going to speed up so I can get through all this. Um, so it's, it's got kernel driver to read data from the analog digital converter. Got a bump recording program testing, and then got a nice big analysis program written in C that puts all the signal processing. Um, the device driver, sadly, I'm stuck with an old kernel. Um, as I said at the beginning, I'm a PhD student, it's a PhD project. Um, the credit I get is for the novel and acoustic stuff. Once the kernel driver was working, I kind of just put it down. So sadly, this is all old, old style pen using. GPIO buffered serial port on the text instruments devices and it doesn't use device tree at all. It'd be really nice to bring this up to date, but I haven't got time myself to do that at the minute. It's a bit hackish, it presents the data as just a character device that you can read this raw sample data out of, and it's controlled by a bunch of IO controls. So it's not standard ways of doing things, but it works. And the analysis software that's a lot more interesting is a very modular library. It's got data producers and data consumers, um, and it's got command line front end, so you can you know write some scripts around this, um, do some high level control of turning the device on and on, start and stop and recording anything like that from a command line level, and sort of interact with it from a remote shell while you're debugging these things. <laughs> A bunch of input drivers, so I can pull data from pretty much anywhere, um, with a combination of, um, well, using lib sound file, sound file reading library, I can pull pretty much any audio format that exists. I'm using Alistair, so I can pull from any sound card, and I've also got this input that talks to my kernel driver and pulls from the uh, dedicated library, and obviously I should convert to that point. Got a couple of data processing modules which implement all the interesting signal processing, 
that these are the these are the biggest in terms of the number of lines of code, um, and they just do all the maths really and spit data out. They they tend to talk to at the minute really go on uh, CSV module, write all the data in a pretty simple format, um, and that can be changed pretty easily. You've also got output to sound files, so I can use this as a uh, as a recording program. The, the software itself, getting into building it, you know, I, I know that my build system is Linux, my device is Linux, so I know how to build software for it. I have no clue how to use things like auto tools. I just wrote make files. It works. Um, when you've got something like this as well, where you know the system, one of the biggest pains I have is getting the tool to work with the software. If you're working on something like this where you know this, the host is Linux, the device is Linux, you know what it's running on, it's really easy to compile stuff shared libraries. Um, it's basically customized build system, make files, um, and a little Python config script. It's about 300 lines um, rather than about 300,000 lines of config. And it still supports all the usual things you would use, like configure a bunch of options, make and make install. So for somebody else who wants to use this, it's dead easy to do the normal things you do with software. Libraries have used um, live sound file, let's say there's all the input output. I'm currently using FFTW for the furry transforms. That, um, so I'm not actually using the dedicated DSP on the arm on the video board. But that's fairly easy to change out and later date if I find it's running too slow. Um, the nice thing with FFTW is it's GPL licensed, so I could actually turn around to the enterprise office of the university and say this has to be released GPL. You can't tell me it can't be. Um, and I used out, um, the ALSA libraries for capturing stuff. Um, what I've done, which I think is really good for this sort of software, I've thrown together Python bindings. The thing with a lot of the signal process, if you might be using something high level like Python to develop all the algorithms in the first place, I've got loads and loads of um, IPython stuff that plots graphs of what all my signal process is supposed to be doing. And then as I've re implemented it in C, I've wrapped all this up in Python bindings, and so I can take the same stuff I used to derive the algorithm, rip out the Python implementation, jam in this wrapped C implementation, plot the same graph, check that it looks the same. So this is really great for building test suites. I also find many people have written unit testing stuff for C, but I quite like the idea of, you know, when something's got a library. Wrapping it in a sort of Python binding, and you can write the whole test suite in a much higher level language. Um, in everything I've done at the minute, IPython has been absolutely fantastic. Um, the, if you're doing any sort of single processing or deriving any sort of algorithms, I'd definitely say look at, look at it, look at the notebook feature. Um, you can write code and plot graphs and have it all tied together. Um, and I managed to avoid proprietary MATLAB, which has made me very, very happy. It's also great for debugging logs. So this is a, a web-based notebook system. You can write some markdown based text. You can write some code and capture the output of it and build it into a notebook. It's really great for doing debugging because you can write some Python code to poke something and plot it and get the results out and write some notes about it and it all forms one big notebook that you can come back to and run that again and see if you get the same results. So that's the, that's the software I've written. Stepping up from there to actually wrap it around this with Open Embedded. Um, Open Embedded has these things called as basically a massive chunk of metadata that says how to build each package, and these are in layers. So I created my own layer that builds my software using Open Embedded. And it's actually really, really simple. I've got about four different recipes which say how to build a different package in my software. I've got one little pen to do the old style of pen using in the kernel. And a little bit of config just to stick in the right support email addresses and put things in the right places. And so looking at Open Embedded itself, writing recipes is actually really, really easy. It's kind of a shell style um, <coughs> variable equals value thing. Um, maybe not quite a shell style. 
but yeah, so you basically give, give a bit of description about the package you're doing and what other packages it depends on. Um, I've kind of shortened some of these, like the source URI is the full source location, that's the git URL to fetch this. Um, in this case, it's a nice little auto revision thing that will just pull whatever the, the head of the git tree is and build that. And then you implement some functions, so you've got sort of different steps that it does. It downloads the software, configures it, compiles it, installs it, and packages it. And these are all done with these little big functions, which are usually shell scripts. And they're pretty easy. The default do compile one just runs make properly, so didn't even need to write that. The only actual shell script I had was a line to call my configure script with the options I wanted. I line to run make with install and give it the desk deal of um, in open embedded S is the source directory, D is the destination it's staging things in. And it's really easy to write these scripts um, and you know the main one is pretty brilliant for asking for help on how to do these things. And it's really quite straightforward, but not straightforward enough. So I wrote some build scripts around this that simplify the build process even further. And they can contain all the required configuration for open embedded for my system. So it's got down to the point where I'm an absolutely fresh machine that's never done any open embedded to build my entire software tree and an actual image to the device. I clone a um, build scripts repository. I run clone all the script that pulls everything down, and that clones the open embedded stuff and all the tools it needs. I run build script, which runs the right open embedded commands to build everything, and then I run a deploy script. And the deploy script is quite nice. It incrementally produces an output directory. It's got all the images to the device. It's got a fully signed package feed that's signed with whatever your GPG signature is. So hopefully you can actually verify this on the device that you're actually installing what you think you are. It's got the entire, every single source that got downloaded. So you, you're in compliance with GPL for redistributing this. And it's got the entire metadata tree as well, um, which I've seen, I think is a really good idea, actually um, bundling up all the open embedded metadata that was used to build this image. So it's a completely repeatable build. Um, and that's, um, that's all on Bitbucket. Um, I'll show some of the URLs later. And it's incremental as well. It uses rsync, so it just pulls what's changed. And as an aside for this, while I was learning how to do this, I created a distribution for the Raspberry Pi, a little test thing, um, using Open Embedded. So just be a really simple test platform for me as to how to understand and customize these things. And it's around about 100, 150 lines of various types of code. And that produces a customized image for the Raspberry Pi with this custom user, um, all branding and stuff. So this is a really great little thing that's a problem with Bitbucket. I'll show you URL later as well. It's a really great little example of um, using Open Embedded and customizing it and producing a package feed. Um, and then what I started doing as I was using this, spotted a couple of minor warnings and problems, started sending patches. The first ones were embarrassingly wrong, um, but it's a pretty good community and they're helping get involved. Um, I did make one fatal mistake. I submitted a couple of patches to OPackage and the file maintainer was inactive. Um, they'd become too busy and kind of moved on to the projects. And the fatal mistake I had was I just kept trying to push these patches. And the consequence was, I needed to maintain it. Um, and one, one quote I got, I'm not going to attribute this, but someone actually said, um, O package seems to make people leave the industry. And yeah, I, the challenge I accepted, I'm not going to be put off by that. Um, and I think I've made that situation a little bit better. So this was around about August last year, so I've been maintaining this for about six months. And before I was maintaining of it, I've written one patch for it. So it's not really the usual situation, but I think we're doing a decent job. So this thing is a package manager for embedded Linux. Um, so this is kind of moving into the second half of my talk. Um, this thing's a package manager for embedded Linux. It has a couple of different components. You know, it's compared to things like um, dpackage is a Debian one, RPM uses 
not part of the web app. And this has a couple of different goals. We're trying to use low memory, low disk space where we can, so it's suitable for running on embedded systems. And we try and do good performance, but where there needs to be a trade-off, tend to trade-off in favor of um, keeping it running on these platforms with limited storage and memory. We mostly need package compatible. That isn't, um, we're not forcing everything to be deep package compatible. So we're kind of starting with the default that what um, Debian does is probably a good idea, but if for, this, for embedded Linux it might not be the right thing. So if there's a good reason, and you can document a good reason for different from the way deep package does things, then we'll do so. Um, it gets used quite a bit. Um, it's used by, it's the default package manager for open embedded, which means it's the default package manager for open Mako, Angstrom, a uh, bunch of other things. Um, it does have non-open embedded users, open WRT, they do open wireless, for, uh, open router for my, I don't know what the WRT stands for. And it's used in some of the Optware builds, and Optware is this thing you can install on um, various routers that do embedded Linux, um, Synology, NAS boxes, and a bunch of other things you use this as a way of being able to customize what software is installed. And some of these use OPackage. OPackage itself got forked from an earlier thing called iPackage. Um, it was originally forked for use in this project called OpenMoco, and it's got picked up and used elsewhere. It's gone through a couple of different maintainers since then, and I've ended up being the most recent one. The thing it came from, my package, started around about 2001, and it was called the ITSI package manager, um, and that had its last commit, according to Olo, was about June 2007. So this is effectively abandoned web. I can't even find a source tree for this. If anybody has a source tree for that the last iPackage package releases, email me so I know what the history of my software is. Um, but it states this is actually still used. Um, if you want to install the Optware stuff on a lot of devices, still use an iPackage, define the fact that it's pretty much abandonware at this point. Um, so I'd really recommend switching to iPackage, especially since it's now maintained again. Uh, it's mostly a drop-in replacement, so yeah, I think it's definitely a good idea to move to that if you're still using that package. Um, recent releases, before I became maintainer, the last releases were end of 2009, early 2010. That's had in the years since 22,000 direct downloads, so we do have a few users. Um, I released, the first release I did was back in September. I put out an 0.2 version, which I didn't really change anything myself. I just took the latest subversion thing that everybody was using and cloned from particular subversion revision number. Um, and so I pretty much just packaged that up and released it so there was a, a basis before I started breaking things. And that's about 4,000 direct downloads, but a lot of people don't download it directly. A lot of people just use the Git tag for that release. So there's probably quite a lot more users than just that. Um, what got added in that release, um, so for anyone who's used some of the older ones, um, added a basic regression test suite so we can actually check that this thing still works. It's got some manual pages finally, um, it can handle circular dependencies, many of the fixes and improvements. As I say, all this code was before I arrived, so that's not really my um, thing. The upcoming releases, I'm pretty much doing a bug fix release in, imminently, hopefully within the next week, and we're in development of the next release, which will probably be within the next six months. And the, the little bug fix release we've put out made the library usable from C++, tidied up a bunch of the headers, and tidied up all the documentation, because in the meantime we've moved from subversion to Git. The subversion tree was on Google Code, and it's all right, but it's better. Um, we've actually got sort of picked up underneath the Octo project, and a lot of people get, there seems to be a bit of confusion as to what is open embedded and what is the Octo project. The Octo project really is this umbrella for 
projects related to embedded Linux. So yeah, they do open embedded and BitBank and those sorts of things. But there's a few tools, and now OPackage is one of them, that are usable from non-open embedded build systems. So like I say, OpenWRT doesn't use open embedded, does use OPackage. So even though we've moved into the umbrella of the Yocto project, that doesn't mean that a non-open embedded user is a second class user. This is very much for anything running embedded Linux. And it's, it's increased the bus factor significantly. If I disappear off the world, there is um, actually, you know, Yocto Project is a Linux Foundation project. There's someone who hopefully we can have some faith that they like recently and appoint a new maintainer. Um, so hopefully the project will carry on. Um, the, so that's the moving to a Git repository on a suitable host. Um, so current in development stuff, massively improved the test suite, um, so we can actually check whether things break as we write new code. But much better FTP um, over SSL support, I think better HTTPS support as well. So some people want even more authentication when they're updating package feeds. If you're using this to install proprietary software on a device, you might want to um, transmit it from your distribution server in an encrypted way. Um, massively improved download caching, that's just gone in the last couple of weeks. So this thing can actually now um, cache and resume interrupted downloads, save some bandwidth. To do it at the minute, there is the bit that's really scared people away from maintaining our packages. It had some code from BusyBox that I think predated BusyBox OPRAT 6. It was taken from BusyBox in about 2001 and hacked out and messed around with. That's all been ripped out. Um, there's, I'm testing those patches at the minute. So pretty soon all that legacy code will just be gone. Um, and we had, there was custom implementation of gzip decompression, tar file handling with a bunch of ugly edge cases in it within that. That's all gone. Um, from 0.3, we're going to have to link against the archive, but I think that's a really positive way forward. That's a maintained thing. Um, it handles things like the implementation we have, couldn't cope with POSIX format tar files, the archive can. Um, it also supports different um, compression algorithms. So traditionally it's just been target GZs um, in the sort of Debian package format. But there are other compression formats that decompress faster on ARM, maybe use less memory to decompress. Or if you've got a bit more processing power, you might want some that produces smaller package files, save some network bandwidth. Actually going to be able to use the same tool and just throw your package together in whatever format you want and it will just handle it. Um, update the documentation as we go and fixing the, there's a couple of high priority books left to fix. That's kind of on the to do list and hopefully within the next six months all that will be cleared and we'll have an open and three out. Future aims after that, further optimise disk and memory use. There's still a lot that can be cut down to make this work on smaller embedded systems. There's still a lot of legacy code that needs cleaning up. There's still a lot of three different code paths to do nominally the same thing, but they do it in a completely different way. So there's still some bits of, that have got a bit of a smell to the code, but it's getting better. And future aims to clean up further. Um, do you want to completely rewrite the library API so that the command currently is the core and the, the library API and the command line stuff are kind of two different views on the core and do things slightly differently. Hopefully going to get a library with a defined API and the command line tool which will be built on top of that API. And improve our compatibility with um, the package where it's appropriate. Um, one of the things in releasing this, which I think really, really helps, and I wish more people would adopt, is I think uh, one of the guys in on GitHub wrote a document for this called Semantic Versioning, Google, you'll find it. Um, basically, have some meaning to version numbers, and this is something I've adopted for OCAD okay, to, to document this a little better. But basically, after version one, it's going to be um, third digit's going to be bug fixes, second's going to be new features. First, it can be backwards incompatible changes. So hopefully when you see that version number's changed, you can see how much has changed. Um, currently, we're in sort of prior to that. So at the minute, every 
0.2 or 0.3 can be backwards incompatible, but I'm going to try and remain compatible with the actual package files and some of the databases so you can do on device upgrades from one version of both package to the next and it won't break your device. Um, and then bug fixes coming in the third digit. There are some knowledge gaps. I mean, I've taken over to maintain this, but one of the things I said earlier is I have no understanding of all two tools. Um, so if you want to contribute, the best thing I need is somebody who can deal with build systems. And manual pages, I have no understanding of how to write for myself. Um, if left to me, I'll break it out and write some markdown that gets pre-processed to create a manual page. But if you want to help out, those are the bits where I think we've got significant knowledge gaps. Other needs I think the project has got, um, definitely much more test cases and example code as to how to use this, and especially from people who are using the library, I'd like to see some good example code from people who are using that so I know how it's actually being used. Um, and some feedback from the non-open embedded users because I'm involved in the open embedded community, I kind of see that feedback automatically. So other people, if you're using it outside of open embedded, it'd be really good to give you some feedback on what you're using, how you're using, what bugs you've got, what internal patches you've got, try and get them upstream. Um, and we don't have a logo, it'd be really nice if someone drew a logo for this. I have often said I've got the artistic ability of a chimp and look with a pile of shit. Can't do art. So if somebody else wants to give us a logo, that'd be pretty good. So conclusions for this, software I've worked for my PhD is massively overkill. Um, it's an actual practical thing that should work rather than just a high level demonstration. Open Embedded, fantastic bit of tools, really good community, got some great features. I know package is pretty much back from, not necessarily dead, but it was, it was fairly active. So that's come back. Um, a couple of more serious science talks I've done on the underwater acoustic stuff. <laughs> And a bunch of links to pretty much everything I've talked about. Um, the, slot, the bottom one is my website. Um, I'm hopefully going to pop these slides up on there probably tomorrow. Um, and my email address is going to the bottom if you want that. Acknowledgements. Um, my PhD supervisor for letting me do something that's actually pretty hands on and technical. Um, all the technicians have actually done a lot of the PCB manufacture and the mechanical design stuff for the Underwater Acoustics hardware. Um, Acknowledgements to the Open Embedded Yonko Project communities for providing this tools to do this work and to everyone who's contributed to O Package past, present, and future. <coughs> Thank you very much.